Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today's episode is called, The Theft of Our Nuclear Weapons Secrets. This is a true story based on the scandal of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Julius Rosenberg was born on May 12, 1918, in New York City, to a family of Jewish immigrants from the Russian Empire. The family moved to the Lower East Side by the time Julius was 11. His parents worked in the shops of the Lower East Side as Julius attended Seward Park High School. Julius became a leader in the Young Communist League USA while at City College of New York during the Great Depression. In 1939, he graduated with a degree in electrical engineering. Ethel Greenglass was born on September 28, 1915, to a Jewish family in Manhattan. She had a brother, David Greenglass. She originally was an aspiring actress and singer, but eventually took a secretarial job at a shipping company. She became involved in labor disputes and joined the Young Communist League, where she met Julius in 1936. They married in 1939. Julius Rosenberg and Ethel Rosenberg were a married couple who were convicted of spying for the Soviet Union, including providing top-secret information about American radar, sonar, jet propulsion engines, and nuclear weapon designs. Convicted of espionage in 1951, they were executed by the federal government of the United States in 1953 at Sing Sing Correctional Facility in Ossining, New York, becoming the first American civilians to be executed for such charges and the first to be executed during peacetime. Other convicted co-conspirators were sentenced to prison, including Ethel's brother, David Greenglass, who had made a plea agreement, Harry Gold, and Morton Sobel. Klaus Fuchs, a German scientist working in Los Alamos, was convicted in the United Kingdom. For decades, many people, including the Rosenberg sons, Michael and Robert Mirapol, maintained that Julius and Ethel were innocent of spying on their country and were victims of Cold War paranoia. When the U.S. government declassified information about them after the fall of the Soviet Union, the declassified information appeared to have included a trove of decoded Soviet cables, codenamed Venona, which detailed Julius's role as a courier and recruiter for the Soviets, and information about Ethel's role as an accessory who helped recruit her brother David into the spy ring and did clerical tasks such as typing up documents that Julius then passed to the Soviets. In 2008, the National Archives of the United States published most of the grand jury testimony related to the prosecution of the Rosenbergs. In January 1950, the U.S. discovered that Klaus Fuchs, a German refugee and theoretical physicist working for the British mission in the Manhattan Project, had given key documents to the Soviets throughout the war. Fuchs identified his courier as American Harry Gold, who was arrested on May 23, 1950. Twenty senior government officials met secretly on February 8, 1950, to discuss the Rosenberg case. Gordon Dean, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, said, It looks as though Rosenberg is the kingpin of a very large ring and if there is any way of breaking him by having the shadow of a death penalty over him, we want to do it. Miles Lane, a member of the prosecution team, said that the case against Ethel Rosenberg was not too strong, but that it was very important that she be convicted too, and given a stiff sentence. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover wrote that proceeding against the wife will serve as a lever to make Julius talk. Their case against Ethel Rosenberg was resolved 10 days before the start of the trial, when David and Ruth Greenglass were interviewed a second time. They were persuaded to change their original stories. David originally had said that he had passed the atomic data he had collected to Julius on a New York Street corner. After being interviewed this second time, 
He said that he had given this information to Julius in the living room of the Rosenberg's New York apartment. Ethel, at Julius's request, had taken his notes and typed them up. In her re-interview, Ruth Greenglass expanded on her husband's version. Julius then took the info into the bathroom and read it, and when he came out, he called Ethel and told her she had to type this information immediately. Ethel then sat down at the typewriter, which she placed on a bridge table in the living room and proceeded to type the information that David had given to Julius. As a result of this new testimony, all charges against Ruth Greenglass were dropped. On August 11th, Ethel Rosenberg testified before a grand jury. For all questions, she asserted her right to not answer as provided by the U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination. FBI agents took her into custody as she left the courthouse. Her attorney asked the U.S. Commissioner to parole her in his custody over the weekend so that she could make arrangements for her two young children. The request was denied. Julius and Ethel were put under pressure to incriminate others involved in the spy ring. Neither offered any further information. On August 17th, the grand jury returned an indictment alleging 11 overt acts. Both Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were indicted, as were David Greenglass and Anatoly Yakovlev. On June 15, 1950, David Greenglass was arrested by the FBI for espionage and soon confessed to having passed secret information on to the USSR through gold. He also claimed that his sister Ethel's husband Julius Rosenberg had convinced David's wife Ruth to recruit him while visiting him in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1944. He said Julius had passed secrets and thus linked him to the Soviet contact agent Anatoly Yakovlev. This connection would be necessary as evidence if there was to be a conviction for espionage of the Rosenbergs. Julius Rosenberg was arrested in July 1950, a few weeks after the Korean War began. He was executed, along with his wife, Ethel, on June 19, 1953, a few weeks before it ended. The legal charge of which the Rosenbergs were convicted was vague, conspiracy to commit espionage. But in a practical sense they were held accountable for giving the so-called secret of the atomic bomb to the USSR. The Rosenbergs' trial took place in March 1951. Federal Judge Irving R. Kaufman pronounced the death sentence in early April. The Rosenberg's attorneys worked for over two years to have the verdict overturned. They appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court nine times, but the court refused to review the record. Neither President Truman nor President Eisenhower granted their requests for clemency. Because the charge was conspiracy, the Rosenberg's conviction required no tangible evidence that they had stolen anything or given it to anybody. The key government witnesses, Ethel's brother and sister-in-law, David and Ruth Greenglass, were charged with the same conspiracy and received more favorable treatment in return for testifying that the Rosenbergs were guilty. The Greenglasses testified that Julius, with Ethel's help, recruited David into an atomic spy ring in 1944 while David worked as a machinist at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico where the first atomic was being built. On the stand in the Rosenberg's trial, the Green Glasses swore that David provided a sketch and an accompanying theoretical description of the bomb to Julius Rosenberg in September 1945, and that Ethel was present and typed up David's notes. In return for their cooperation, David received a sentence of 15 years in prison and served 10 before being released and Ruth Greenglass, who testified that she helped steal what the prosecution called the most important scientific secret ever known to mankind, was never even indicted. During the trial, David Greenglass also testified that he gave another set of sketches to Harry Gold, 
who used the recognition signal I come from Julius to identify himself to David when they first met. Gold testified that he was a spy courier transmitting information from atomic scientist Klaus Fuchs to the Soviet Union, but that on this one occasion he received information from Greenglass. FBI documents first made public in the late 1970s show that David Greenglass originally claimed Gold identified himself as Dave from Pittsburgh, while Gold first said he identified himself to Greenglass as Ben from Brooklyn. One FBI file shows that after several months in prison, but before the trial, prosecutors brought Gold and Greenglass together to iron out this discrepancy. It was at that meeting that Gold and Greenglass suddenly remembered the name Julius in the recognition signal. The Rosenbergs testified in their own defense at their trial and denied all charges. They invoked their Fifth Amendment rights and refused to answer repeated prosecution questions about their political affiliations. During the McCarthy period, Many felt that such a refusal to answer was an admission of Communist Party membership and that all Communists were spies for the Soviet Union. Following the three-week trial, both Rosenbergs were convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage, as was their co-defendant, Morton Sobel. Sobel received a 30-year sentence, while the Rosenbergs were given the death penalty. Judge Kaufman justified the death sentence as follows, I consider your crimes worse than murder. I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians, the A-bomb, years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea, with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000 and who knows how many millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason. He concluded that the Rosenbergs' love for their cause dominated their lives, it was even greater than their love for their children. Despite Kaufman's assertion about the supposed value of the information the Rosenbergs allegedly passed to the Soviets, a chorus of leading scientists including Harold Urey and J. Robert Oppenheimer stated that there was no secret of the atomic bomb. Years later, Many atomic scientists agreed with a colleague's assessment that the green glass material was too incomplete, ambiguous, and even incorrect to be of any service or value to the Russians in shortening the time required to develop their nuclear bombs. Decades later, the 1995 release by the CIA of the Venona transcriptions of KGB files caused the mainstream media to renew prior conclusions that the Rosenbergs were guilty. The transcriptions, however, do not point to the Rosenbergs' involvement in atomic espionage. The name Julius Rosenberg is never mentioned. According to these documents, the spy codenamed Antenna and later Liberal, whom the U.S. government claims was Julius Rosenberg, was engaged in military-slash-industrial rather than atomic espionage. One transmission reports that this codenamed spy was ignorant of the atomic bomb project. Even more remarkably, the key reference to Liberal's wife states that she was not an espionage agent. Another significant development in the Rosenberg case came in 2008 when the transcripts of the testimony of 43 of the 46 witnesses who appeared before the grand jury that indicted the Rosenbergs were released to the public. This material included the testimony of Ruth Greenglass, who was deceased at that point, but not that of David Greenglass, who was still alive. David's testimony was not released until 2015, following his death. At the time of the first release of grand jury material in 2008, Morton Sobel, then in his 90s, acknowledged publicly that he, along with Julius Rosenberg, passed non-atomic, military-industrial information to the USSR. He said the primary purpose of this work was to help the USSR defeat the Nazis during World War II. Despite this fact, these transcripts reveal startling contradictions between Ruth and David Greenglass' sworn testimony before the grand jury and at trial. 
Before the grand jury, neither Greenglass mentioned the allegedly crucial September 1945 meeting the supposed atomic bomb sketch that they later said David gave to Julius at that meeting any handwritten notes from David about the sketch or bomb. Ethel Rosenberg doing any typing of these supposed notes or Ethel's presence at the alleged meeting. These contradictions between the Green Glass's sworn testimony at trial and before the grand jury, coupled with FBI files indicating that Ethel was only arrested to use as a lever to coerce Julius into disgorging information, has led to growing calls for Ethel's exoneration. The trial of the Rosenbergs on federal espionage charges began on March 6, 1951, in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. Judge Irving Kaufman presided over the trial, with Assistant U.S. Attorney Irving leading the prosecution and criminal defense lawyer Emanuel Block representing the Rosenbergs. The prosecution's primary witness, David Greenglass, said that he turned over to Julius Rosenberg a sketch of the cross-section of an implosion-type atom bomb. This was the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, as opposed to a bomb with the gun method triggering device used in the Little Boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima. On March 29, 1951, the Rosenbergs were convicted of espionage. They were sentenced to death on April 5 under Section 2 of the Espionage Act of 1917, which provides that anyone convicted of transmitting or attempting to transmit to a foreign government information relating to the national defense may be imprisoned for life or put to death. Prosecutor Roy Cohn later claimed that his influence led to both Kaufman and Irvine being appointed to the Rosenberg case and that Kaufman imposed the death penalty based on Cohn's personal recommendation. Cohn would go on later to work for Senator Joseph McCarthy, appointed as chief counsel to the investigation subcommittee during McCarthy's tenure as chairman of the Senate Government Operations Committee. In imposing the death penalty, Kaufman noted that he held the Rosenbergs responsible not only for espionage, but for American deaths in the Korean War. I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb, years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea, with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000 and who knows, but that millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason. Indeed, by your betrayal, you undoubtedly have altered the course of history to the disadvantage of our country. The U.S. government offered to spare the lives of both Julius and Ethel if Julius provided the names of other spies, and they admitted their guilt. The Rosenbergs made a public statement, by asking us to repudiate the truth of our innocence, the government admits its own doubts concerning our guilt, we will not be coerced, even under pain of death, to bear false witness. The execution was delayed from the scheduled date of June 18 because Supreme Court Associate Justice William Douglas had granted a stay of execution on the previous day. This stay resulted from intervention in the case by Fike Farmer, a Tennessee lawyer whose efforts had been scorned by the Rosenberg's attorney Emanuel Hirsch Block. The execution was scheduled for 11 p.m. the evening of June 19, during the Sabbath, which begins and ends around sunset. Block asked for more time, filing a complaint that execution on the Sabbath offended the defendant's Jewish heritage. Rhoda Lax, another attorney on the Rosenberg's defense team, also made this argument before Judge Kaufman. The defense's strategy backfired. Kaufman, who stated his concerns about executing the Rosenbergs on the Sabbath, rescheduled the execution for 8 p.m. before sunset and the Sabbath, the regular time for executions at Sing Sing. On June 19, 1953, Julius died from the first electric shock. Ethel's execution did not go smoothly. After she was given the normal course of three electric shocks, 
Attendants removed the strapping and other equipment only to have doctors determine that Ethel's heart was still beating. Two more electric shocks were applied, and at the conclusion eyewitnesses reported that smoke rose from her head. The book Final Verdict, published in 2010, gave further weight to the argument that Ethel Rosenberg was wrongfully convicted and that Julius espionage in the 1940s for the USSR did not include any transmission of atomic information. The author's meticulous research, in fact, reveals even more information that corroborates the claim that evidence against Ethel was fabricated. The book details the finding that when Julius Rosenberg was fired from the Army Corp of Engineers in January 1945, the USSR suspended him from all ongoing activities because they feared that the U.S. had discovered Julius was spying. The KGB files indicate Julius engaged in no further espionage activities in 1945. Thus, the supposed espionage meeting between the Rosenbergs and David Greenglass, which the Greenglasses testified took place in September 1945, would not have occurred. Instead, final verdict concludes, with supporting evidence from KGB files, that Ruth Greenglass, on her own, without the Rosenbergs' involvement, met with a Soviet agent on December 21, 1945, and delivered the sketch the government called The Secret of the Atomic Bomb. That sketch was logged into the main KGB file center in Russia on December 27, 1945. This information inconsistent with the failure of either Greenglass to mention the September 1945 meeting in their grand jury testimony. It supports the summary of the case. Julius Rosenberg engaged in non-atomic espionage for the Soviet Union during the 1940s. At least nine months after the Soviets suspended their relationship with Julius, the Green Glasses delivered atomic information of relatively little value to the Soviet Union without the Rosenberg's assistance. Neither Rosenberg was a member of an atomic spy ring that stole the secret of the atomic bomb. The United States government knew all along that Ethel Rosenberg was not an espionage agent, and that Julius was not an atomic spy, but executed them both anyway. Thanks for listening to another podcast of the True Crime Tales. Please come again and remember. Please subscribe.